over the last several weeks, you know, this month we had our singles conference, which was great. Um, last week, um, P. Wall talked a little bit about uh, ungodly soul ties. And, you know, last week he gave a homework assignment uh, for, for anyone to go home and, you know, speak those names that they had ungodly soul ties with to God. You know, and, and, and we declare that if you did that, those soul ties are broken in the name of Jesus and your soul is restored. Amen. So um, I'm going to stay a little bit with the soul and uh, a question for you. Um, how many of us have heard that eyes are the windows to the soul? Anyone ever heard that statement, eyes are the windows to the soul? Okay, a few people. Um, a few years ago at Cornell University, at Cornell University, they did a study that they believed actually proved this, that eyes are the windows to the soul because of the first conduits of sight. You know, their belief was that you could see or understand someone's soul based off of their vision, based off of their eyes. So, you know, this had me think, and I, I enjoy science. I enjoy really everything about it. And one thing about science and research is that uh, they tend to do research on things of importance, things of value. And sometimes science can take material things and try to prove uh, material things out of immaterial stuff or eternal things like the soul. So then it begs the question, you know, what exactly is the soul? What exactly is the soul? So we're actually going to watch a, a short video here. Um, and there's some leaders that you may know that actually answered this question on what is the soul. Take a listen. What is the soul? The soul is that part of you that existed before you were born and it will exist after you die. It's the highest, most noble part of yourself that you can reach for. The soul, I believe, is the fingerprint of God that becomes the physical body. Whoa. <laughs> I believe that. It's the fingerprint. Like if you put it on a piece of paper, and it's and it's unique to everybody. Oh my goodness, does that not touch me in a powerful way? Did you just have that answer waiting? Yes. <laughs> just the fingerprint of God that becomes the physical body, unique in its own development and expression, but filled with the divinity that is the essence of all that is. The soul is the core of your being. It is eternal. It doesn't exist in space-time. It's a field of infinite possibilities, infinite creativity. It's your internal reference point with which you should always be in touch. The soul is the spirit. It is the connecting line uh, to God. I believe the soul is where the Holy Spirit resides. I believe that it is literally, you know, when you pick up the phone, and that you have your, you know, your 4G network. <laughs> the soul is the 4G network to right to heaven to me. The soul is the spiritual essence of who we really are. The soul is, I think, our, our capacity to see that our lives are about something more than simply the day to day, and that our lives, are, that we're here for a purpose, that it, it could be connected to religion or not, uh -huh. but that there is a purpose of your being here. Well, to me, the soul is a part of us that never dies. It's who we are at our core, and um, it carries all the messages and the lessons that we've learned in the past, and we'll carry all the lessons and the messages that we will carry into the future. So, we, so in, the video, in the video, we heard some commonalities about what is the soul. You heard things like who we are at our core, the fingerprint of God, the core of our becoming, the part of us that never dies, your innermost being, who you are, the lure of our becoming. 
So earlier this week, for kicks and giggles just for me, I decided to ask my oldest son this kind of question, just because, you know, when you ask a child something, they give you very interesting answers. And so I said, Tenny, if I asked you what the soul is, what would you say? Do you know what that is? What is the soul? And he said, uh, Daddy, no. But then he was like, oh, yeah, 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 I know. Respect, responsibility, and ready. And I was like, you know, respect, responsibility, and ready doesn't even make sense. And I thought for him, and I was like, uh, I've heard that before somewhere. And I realized that all he was doing was giving me the core values at his elementary school. I was like, oh, man, boy, go sit down somewhere. Go sit down somewhere. <laughs> but then I thought about it for a little bit. And, you know, I, I realized, like, well, there might be something to what he was saying that had some correctness there. See, the soul is the part of you that has judgment. It makes decisions whether you want to be responsible, whether you want to be respectful. Soul involves your will. Your will chooses to, re to reject things. Your soul is the part of you that has emotion, fear, sensitivity. It's the mental capacity for you to store some knowledge. There is something inside of us that is beyond science to know. The soul is the life center of human beings. Before we get into the scripture, uh, I want to tell you a story, um, brief background here so that we can kind of set the, the stage for what we're going to discuss. Um, there was once a, a town, a village, high in the mountains. Um, through that village ran this wonderful stream. The stream was fed by springs from the earth and from the deep sea. The, 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 the stream was beautiful, crystal clear. Children used to love playing around it. Swans would swim in it and fly away. Crystal clear water in which you could see um, the most fabulous fish. Higher above those mountains, there was an old man who was the keeper of the springs. His role was to go through the springs, take away branches, debris, and anything else that may, be, that may muddy or cloudy the water. He was the keeper of the springs. He had been hired so long ago that really no one even remembered that he was there, and the work that he did was really unseen. Eventually, the town decided, you know, I wanna be, we, wanna be, we wanna become more urban. We wanna do things like build roads, collect taxes, do various things. We don't have time to pay this old man who's not really seen. So the old man left his post and went on his way. Soon later, years pass, twigs, branches, debris start to line the springs. And the water that was once clear started to become muddied and dirty. At first, no one in the village knew. You know, they didn't even pay attention to it. They went about their own ways, turned into that urban lifestyle. But over time, people in the village started to notice the terrible presence of the water. It was no longer clear. Swans flew away. Fish no longer, no longer stayed there. The rocks were no longer beautiful. All the village noticed the sparkling beauty of the stream was gone. See, the life of the village depended on the stream, and the life of the stream depended on the keeper. Several years later, um, the, the, the council of the village decided they came to their senses, and they, they said, you know what, let's, let's get that old man back. So the old man came back, and re he returned to his post. And eventually, over time, as he went back to do what he was doing, taking away the branches, clearing out debris, the stream eventually became crystal clear again. The village came back to life. See, the life of the village depended on the health of the stream. See, everyone, the, the stream is your soul, and you are the keeper. So I've titled today's message, Soul Keeper. I hope to give you a few things to help continue and protect what's inside of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, as we take some time um, to speak your word, Father, we pray that you just um, speak through me. Let it not be my words that your children hear, Father, but let it be yours. Let it be things that can resonate in the body of your children. In your name we've prayed. Amen. To Mark 8, 34 to 38, Mark 8, 34 to 38. 
be reading from the NIV, Mark 8, 34 to 38. And it says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in his adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed when he comes to the Father's glory with his holy angels. See, Jesus said that our soul is worth more than the entire world. This means that there's great value on our souls. So it's important for us to be good keepers. So my first point, in order to be a good keeper of your soul, we have to get comfortable with soul searching. We have to get comfortable with soul searching. See, our human nature is, is naturally to avoid uncomfortable situations. Just because something is not good or is hard does not mean that we need to avoid it. When we're looking at our souls, the natural thing for us to do is actually get scared and get and fear away from it, not take a look. There's a sense of unease when you actually have to look and dissect what's inside of you. And so it gets so bad that some people don't even want to do any kind of soul searching. We live in a social, social media driven age in which we're exposed to so many external influences that prevent us from actually taking time to look at ourselves and be proper keepers. See, God is looking for us to have joy, peace, and hope. But in order for that to happen, we have to be comfortable with the uneasy questions, the feelings that we have about ourselves. The questions that reveal actually what's hurting inside. We have to do that, we have to soul search. Through soul searching, you're able to find purpose and you're able to find wholeness. My second point, point number two, speak to your soul. Speak to your soul. You know, when I was preparing this message uh, earlier this week, there was a time in which it was late at night um, and I was tired, I was weary, let me tell you. And I had a whole bunch of context, but I didn't know what to do with it. And you know, I, I, I was so tired, I said, Lord, help me, help me. I don't have anything in me anymore, help me. And so I went to sleep thinking that I would have this fantastic dream and the Lord would tell me what to do and I woke up the next morning and write everything down. You know, unfortunately that didn't happen. But, but God is good. He works in mysterious ways. As I was on my way to work that morning, I cut on the radio um, to my Christian radio station. And the song that came on uh, was by Matt Redman, 10,000 Reasons. And, and at first, uh, I didn't really pay attention to it. And then the chorus kicked in. And you know, the song by Matt Redman is best off of Psalms 103. And the chorus goes, bless the Lord, O my soul. O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I will worship your holy name. You know, they went and I looked and, and they, they asked Matt about his reasoning behind writing this song. And he said that if you wake up in the morning and you can't find some way to tell your soul to praise the Lord, then something is wrong with you on the inside and it's not God. When you actually look at Psalm 103, it's possible and it seems that David, the psalmist here, was going through a spiritually dry season, or he could have been experiencing a divided heart. But as the keeper of his soul, he spoke to it and used it to worship God. See, in times when things are tough, when, when things are rough, we must tell our souls to worship. We must speak to it. Psalms 42, one to six, I'm gonna read from the NIV here, Psalms 42, one to six. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is my God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throne. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, 
for I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. People, in the word of God, people spoke to their soul. Soul talk is prayer. Soul talk is worship. God gave us the capacity to master our emotions in our soul. As a soul keeper, it is important to speak to what is within you. The next time you're upset, you're in that long Chick-fil-A line, or you're at that store that has 30 registers and only one of them is open, and you're angry, ask yourself, soul, why are you so downcast? And see what happens. Whatever situation you're in, in this season, speak the hope of Christ into your soul. He is our strength and the very anchor of our souls. So point number one was soul searching. Point number two was speak to our soul. And point number three, gotta let our souls rest. Let your soul rest. Just like the body needs rest, our souls need to rest as well. Matthew verse 11, sorry, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Matthew chapter 11, 20 to 30, I'm gonna read from the NIV. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In our time of rest, we can experience God's presence in our time of rest. Psalms 23, I'm just going to read this to you just because of time. Psalms 23, 2 to 3 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. See, the Bible said that he makes me lie down. It doesn't say anything about it was an invitation or it was an option. He said he makes me lie down. When it comes to rest, we need to restore our souls. For those of you who have young children, you know that when it's bedtime, it's the, it's the toughest time in the house because the child doesn't want to go to bed even though they're tired. But as a keeper, as a good parent, you eventually take them and you make them go to bed. Is it bedtime for your soul? See, the space where we find rest and healing for our souls is in solitude. God chooses to meet us in the space we make for rest. Because when we make space for rest, it's not filled with busyness. It's your green pastures. It's your still waters. Ask yourself, where are your green pastures? Where are your still waters? For our souls to be well kept and revived, we need solitude. We need silence, no distractions. Time to sit down and let God actually speak to us. That's what it means to be a good keeper of our soul. So point number one was soul searching. Point number two, speak to your soul. And point number three was let your soul rest. So my last point, I'm going to sit down, um, is to stay away from junk promises. Stay away from junk promises. You know, when our body needs energy, we give it food. But when our soul needs hope, the only thing that we can give it is promises. Because promises have to do with the future. And hope is only something that you can think about for the future. If our future is promising, our soul will be hopeful. Even if the present isn't going so well. Hope is what keeps the soul going. I want to read from Hebrews 6, 18 to 20. I'm going to read from the NLT. Uh, Hebrews 6, 18 to 20. And it says, so God has given both his promises and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold, the, as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. I want to talk about food just for, just for a second. 
you know, not all food is, is nourishing. Some food actually is not good for your body. You know, we call that, we call that junk food. And, you know, I have to admit, y'all got to pray for me because I, I, I enjoy junk food, unfortunately. Um, there's something about going through the grocery store line and checking out that I always have to pick up that orange Kit Kat looking um, candy bar as I'm checking out. So, you know, I need y'all to pray for me. Candy bars taste good, but it can't be the staple of a diet. A diet on candy may satisfy your stomach for the time being, but it doesn't your body. It doesn't give us the energy that we actually need or the proper nutrients in order to move forward and get through the day. In fact, when we eat too much junk food, things happen, bad things happen. We get a sugar overload, we start to gain weight. It negatively impacts our bodies. <sighs> Y'all gotta pray for me. <laughs> Similarly, there are healthy promises and there's junk promises. Both, in turn, will do the same thing in the immediate. They produce hope. But healthy promises provide the right kind of hope and promote health throughout the human soul. Those junk promises eventually become toxic and are toxic to the soul. See, in the world we live in, the the devil, um, very aware that our souls need promises, which is why there's junk promises everywhere. They're packaged nicely, they taste good, they're convenient, but they're junk. See, junk promises always disappoint because there's a satisfactional high followed by hope that plunges into guilt, into shame, into emptiness. They never deliver the happiness they promise because our souls are designed for better hope. See, the only way to break the habit of junk promises is to cultivate a taste for rich, nourishing, true promises. Our souls are designed to be nourished by God's promises, his precious promises. This is why Jesus calls himself the bread of life. The past grace of his death and resurrection guarantee a never-ending stream of hope. See, to eat these promises is to eat this living bread and live forever. The great thing is that Jesus has made his Bible the storehouse of nourishing. It's a living soul food for us. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet that you don't even have to pay for. See, the God of hope wants us to feast on his promises and be filled with joy, with peace, and believing. That's what it takes to be the keepers of our souls. So point number one was soul searching. Point number two, speak to your soul. Point number three, and the last point, all right, yes, yeah, stay away from junk promises. You are the keeper of your soul. One day our time on earth is going to end and we're going to stand before the kings of kings and he will speak to us about what our soul has become. Are you a keeper of your soul? Are we speaking to our soul when it's downcast? Are we not shying away from actually looking at the and Are we giving our souls rest? so that we can hear from the Lord? Are we eating healthy promises and taking care of ourselves? Or are we so focused on the junk promises that give us such little hope? See, we tend to take care of things that matter to us. You ever see the person that got the new car, let's say, a and parks it in a certain location? Or at work, at school, they park it far away so that no one dents that car? They want to take care of what's new. Or the person that just got the new kicks and walks with the limp because they don't want to get the crease in the front of their shoe. We have been programmed in this world to take care of what matters to us, the material things. But we fail to take care of our stream, our soul. See, God sees your soul as the most valuable thing. 
in the world. So valuable that he sent his only son to the cross to suffer and die just so that our souls could be saved. And if we were the only person in the universe, Christ still would have sent his son. Are you the keeper of your soul? Let's bow down and pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this time um, that we spent in your presence, Lord. We pray, Lord, that from this time forward, you help us to be better soul keepers, Father. That we take time to search, that we speak to our souls. That, Father, that we, that we stay away from, from the junk promises and that we give our souls rest, Lord. We thank you, Lord for, Lord, for everything that you've done in the lives of your children. We thank you for restoration to our souls, Father. As we continue, Lord, as we go through um, the remainder of the weeks of our lives, help us to continually work to improve that which resides in us, Father. I never want to leave the stage without um, praying for those who don't yet know Christ. And so, um, for, for you that, that were on the fence and, and just not yet sure about actually accepting Christ into your heart, so I just want you to pray this prayer with me silently. I'm in your heart. Father, Lord, we believe and I believe and I trust in you. I know, Lord, that I am a sinner. Father, forgive me. Father, as the keeper of the most valuable thing in this world, at this very moment in time, I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son for my soul. Thank you for all you've done. In your name, I've prayed. Amen.